Okay, so the next speaker who's getting hooked up now is Illa Thetan. She's at the University of Texas, Austin, and she's going to speak on a new class of neural population codes. And um, <coughs> Illa is a, a theoretician who takes computational approaches to look at some of the questions that John Donahue presented earlier. So just what are the dynamics of systems? What are the um, principles of coding? In her case, being applied to uh, learning and memory. All right, so um, I guess I'm the, I'm glad that you're all fueled up from the snack break, so I guess I'm the sort of odd person out. Uh, I'm a computational neuroscientist, and I'll tell you a little bit about um, some work in understanding um, some neural codes, and um, that I'm quite excited about these days um, in specific, and also um, I have some thoughts about how um, some of the insights might help us understand other higher level um, neural codes a little bit better. All right. so. Um, you know, uh, I want to start just with this very simple observation, which is that the computational elements of the brain um, are quite noisy, right? So here's um, a synapse, and we all know from um, our first neuroscience class that uh, vesicle release after the presynaptic neuron has spiked is a stochastic process, right? So transmitter release and communication between neurons is stochastic. Um, and also the spiking of neurons appears to be stochastic. So repeated uh, responses to the same repeated stimulus um, will produce um, variable numbers of spikes in one time bin, um, and um, um, you know these kinds of stochastic processes that are happening in our fundamental computing units in the brain um, are really introducing noise into the representations that the brain constructs and the computations that it performs. Okay, so almost needless to say, right, errors that are there in the units, computational units, can lead to um, can be problematic, right, when the brain wants to perform accurate computation. Okay, so these problems are especially, it's especially true when the computation that's being performed is recursive, okay, where um, the brain does some computation and then builds on it and then does another computation on top of that and so on, right? The noise in one step can accrue. So, for example, this is an example of path integration, right? So you go to a new city and you go take a walk from your hotel, you know, visit some shops and then walk around the riverbank. Right? In this city, the relative locations of the landmarks are unfamiliar to you. You cannot use them to estimate exactly where you are in space. Okay? But now, you know, after the end of your, of your walk here, now you have to rush back to dinner at your hotel, and um, you want to do that, you want to go back straight. Okay? So you need to have an accurate estimate of where you are over here to decide what is the right way back um, to the hotel. Okay? But if there's small errors that are um, accruing, right? in, every t in every step there's a small error, those errors tend to accrue. So even though these vectors are correct, um, little errors in the representation just will add up so that over time, the vector that you would compute to go back to the hotel, if you apply it to where you actually are, will lead you astray. Okay? So, in other words, um, because of this ongoing noise, these errors can add up and they can actually swamp and render completely useless the computation that's being performed. At this point, you, you know, I mean, if, if the trajectory had been even longer, you know, it could be that it would, the, 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 it would, you would compute that the hotel is over that way. So at that point, you need not even have bothered doing this path integration in the first place. Okay, so it really can be very problematic. So given that that is true, right, how does the brain control for these effects of noise? What does it do? How does it deal with it? Okay, so in neural population codes, which um, we've all seen to some degree, uh, a large population of neurons encodes the same variable. So for example, here is a variable like stimulus angle. Imagine something like V1 orientation tuning. Um, there's a stimulus angle, um, and all the different neurons have very similar responses to the stimuli, okay? But maybe they're just shifted in their preferred orientation, right? But they have basically the same tuning curve. Well, in such a case, you know, reconstructing the stimulus values, so you know, these are the average tuning curves of the neurons, but on any given trial, they'll emit some variable number of spike counts, right? These different colored neurons emit some variable number of spike counts, and they give you some estimate of the, of, the, of the variability in these bars here. And then either you, as a scientist, or the brain, you know, downstream areas of the brain, have to then construct an estimate of what it is that this population of neurons is representing. So in the, in the estimated stimulus, constructed from the variable spike counts of these neurons, there is some error, delta theta, in reconstructing the value that's represented. Okay? And the statement is just that population codes, because there are multiple neurons that are representing this variable in a noisy way, you can get an improvement in your total error than if it was just the response of one noisy neuron. Okay? So in other words, many neurons are broadly tuned, and many neurons fire, representing the variable, and it leads to a smaller estimation error. So how does the error scale with the number of neurons? So you increase the number of neurons, how does the error go down? Okay? So there's a lot of work. This is um, classical work on um, neural coding. Um, a lot of work shows that if you um, imagine that the, the variability is independent per neuron, 
then you can achieve something like 1 over n reduction in squared error with number of neurons. Okay, as n goes up, your squared error goes down as 1 over n. Okay, in other words, the accuracy increases polynomially, linearly in n. Okay, now there's a cost of that increase in accuracy. What is the cost of that increase in accuracy? Well, you've just introduced a bunch of redundancy, right? You have a bunch of neurons doing the same thing. So we can define that as, as this quantity called the information rate. This is an important quantity. It represents the number of true information bits you're getting out of the representation. How much information are you really getting out of the whole thing versus how many total bits are being conveyed by the neuron spiking in a noisy way. Okay, and it turns out that this information rate, um, it scales like log n over n, which goes to is a quantity log n is much smaller than n, and so this goes to zero as n gets large. Okay, so your information rate, the amount of information you're able to convey as a fraction of the number of neurons, it, that, that, that quantity is, is basically going to zero. Okay, so that's nice, you know, that's how population codes work. It seems good, but, you know, is this really the best use we could make of that extra neural currency we just put in? We just put in all these other neurons. Is this the best that could be done in theory and in practice? Okay, so I just want to give you a few more examples. This was the V1 example. Here's um, coding of place cells, uh, coding location. This is X and Y position of an animal in space, and you know, different place cells have activity at different places. Here's ocular motor coding, firing uh, rate of neurons goes up as the deflection of the eye increases away from the nasal, uh, and so on. So all these codes and all these population codes, um, uh, these, all these population codes have the same behavior. They produce linear increases in uh, squared error, uh, linear increases in accuracy with n, and decrease of information rate, okay? And I'm going to call all of these by definition because they have that scaling. I'm going to call them classical population codes. So, so to answer the question of how good are these population codes, um, I want to just give you a very simple example, okay? Very simple. No, neuro no neurons here, okay? Something very simple just to sort of give a sense of whether or not these population codes are performing well or not. Okay, so here's a very simple uh, repetition code. Suppose that you're talking over a telephone or some other noisy communication channel, right? And you're trying to just transmit uh, either a one or a zero. You're trying to convey the message one or message zero to the person on the other line, end of the line. Okay, but there's some probability P with which a one will be heard as a zero or a zero will be heard as a one. Okay, and P is smaller than half. Okay, it's something small. Okay, so here's maybe the simplest possible way to ensure um, that you're likely to be heard correctly. Okay, so if you say it once, well, there's a chance P that it's going to be heard wrong. Okay, so one simple way to control the error, a simple error correcting code, is to just simply repeat the number that you're trying to transmit n times. So instead of saying zero, you're just going to say it three times, zero, 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 or one, one, one. Okay, so now the probability of error, okay, and what, who, the person at the other end is going to decode, okay, and the person's going to decode by saying, did I hear more zeros or more ones? Okay, if they heard more ones, they're going to decode it as a one. Okay, so how, how is, how is um, performance scaling? Well, the error probability is actually going down um, sharply as n, goes to, as n gets large. Okay, so it's nice. It goes down like this. But now let's, again, revisit this quantity, the information rate. And what we see here is that the information rate, which is, again, the number of information bits divided by the total bits. Well, how many information bits are you conveying? There's just one bit. It's either one or zero. That's the only message you're conveying, right? That's just one bit. So it's one on top, but you're saying it n times. So you're using it n times. So the information rate is one over n, which is, again, going to zero with n. Okay? So this is um, the reason why I introduced this example is that this is basically almost direct analog um, for discrete variables as the population, neural population codes were for analog variables, okay? So in this repetition code, um, exponentially varying error rate, that's what you get, but you get it at, an, uh, at a zero information rate, okay? So as n gets large. But classical population codes are coding for analog quantities, right? So they, they're not doing as well. They don't get exponential reduction in error rate. They're only getting polynomial reduction in error rate. It's going down like, error is going down like 1 over n squared error. But again, you also have, you know, so they're, they're doing worse, but that's fair because it's doing analog versus discrete. But unfortunately, again, the error rate, um, uh, information rate is going to zero. Okay? So it seems like, you know, this is the cost. You just have to deal with this um, zero information rate to get, you know, correct, correct information um, to go through. So the question is, you know, is it really possible to do qualitatively better? Is it possible to do much, much better qualitatively? Now, it turns out that before 1948, it was believed that it's impossible, okay? The, the necessary cost of error-free communication or representation, what have you, involves a zero information rate. You just have to increase your redundancy, that increases your information rate, and that's that. 
Okay, so it was widely believed, it was completely believed it was impossible until, of course, along came um, Shannon. Okay, and what was truly, truly remarkable is that Shannon proved the astonishing result that there are codes that make it possible to get zero information, uh, error rate at a finite information rate. Information rate does not need to go to zero. And that was just astonishing. I mean, it was, you bowled over whole communities of, I mean, everybody believed that that was not possible. Okay, so, um, so that was the statement, right? So he, he made the statement that it's possible to achieve asymptotically zero error rate at a finite information rate. He said this for discrete variables, but for analog variables, the, the corresponding statement is that it should be possible to get exponentially small errors at a finite information rate, okay? Exponentially small versus polynomial small, so much smaller errors and at finite rather than zero information rate. So the question is, does the brain contain such codes, okay? Does it? Okay, so this is the protagonist of the story. It's my muse. And uh, most of you are familiar with this curious response of, um, of grid cells. Okay, this is a single cell in internal cortex. Um, each dot is a, a spike of the cell. The black line is the trajectory of an animal as it's exploring a space. And you can see that the cell is spiking at uh, multiple blobs, right? At these multiple discrete locations in space that form a very nice regular pattern. It's actually a triangular lattice um, in space. Okay, so um, there are many reasons, um, independent of this, um, this, this, this coding that seems to be happening here, to think that um, these grid cells may be the, uh, the neural substrates for path integration, like the path integration I described in the first uh, couple of slides. Okay, um, and um, now nearby cells, like this is one cell, other cells that are nearby this cell um, have the same um, pattern uh, period, the same spacing between the blobs, and they have the same angle of this lattice, Okay, the only way in which they differ is they differ by shifts in phase. So instead of firing here and here in these two blobs, the next cell might fire at the interstices of these blobs to shift this pattern um, accordingly. Okay, so um, let me just try to formalize what you see here in, in what you saw in the previous slide in one dimension. Okay, so here are three different cells that are near each other. Uh, the blue cell is firing here, 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 and here periodically. So is the purple cell with the same period, but they're just shifted versions of each other. So now if I tell you that the blue cell is firing, what do you know about where the animal is? Well, you know it's either at this location or here or here or here, but you don't know whether it's in this box or this box or this box. So it's a periodic code, right? And all you know is location x of the animal as a function, as a phase re with respect to this periodic period, with respect to this periodic response with period lambda alpha. Okay, so you know this phase as a period, uh, as, you know x position as a phase uh, modulo the period. Okay, so in other words, the whole population of neurons that have the same spatial period are representing location as a phase, okay? A phase of a periodic response. Okay, so this, this um, is um, um, one of the phenomenological statements about grid cells. Here is another finding, which is that as you move along this entorhinal cortex, um, along some, a strip in it, um, along a certain axis, from dorsal to ventral, the cells have different spatial periods, okay? They go from a small periods of about 30 centimeters to large periods of about three meters. But even three meters is much, much smaller than the overall scale over which animals care to explore. So rats go around per day, exploring for food over a kilometer, 100 meters to a kilometer per linear dimension, okay? So, so this is the scale that animals care about, but this is the biggest grid, that's the smallest grid. So in other words, if you have n different networks with n different spatial periods, then the code for location x is the set of n different phases with respect to these n different periods. I'm sorry, that should read lambda n, not lambda 1. Okay, so now um, this seems bizarre. What a weird code because you're using periodic responses, periodic responses, and a non-local code for a variable that, which is animal location, which is not periodic, and it's local. Seems strange, okay? Just to drive home how strange it is, it's like representing time of the day instead of using a single 12-hour clock. It's like using a bunch of little clocks that each have a period not of 12 hours, but nine minutes, 10 minutes, 11 minutes, and they're just turning around every 11 minutes, or every 14, or every 17 minutes. You have this wall full of clocks. Why would you do this? Okay, why not just use a single clock, like a place cell, to represent space, like you use a single clock to represent time? Okay, so to, to give you some intuition for this, I want to tell you um, a short story, okay? And uh, to, to <laughs> the short story is about Amazon.com um, and how it does its warehousing um, of its inventory. 
Okay, so, so um, I don't know about you guys, but when I go shopping, um, for example, I have young kids, I have a daughter, and she has very specific, um, you know, things that she wants me to buy for her. Like, she wants the uh, uh, Tinkerbell underwear that's pink and size 5. Okay, so I go to the store, I go to Target or whatever, and I, I go to the aisle and find um, the underwear, but I'm looking for Tinkerbell. Ah, oh, there's Tinkerbell. Oh, but that's blue. Ah, oh, I found pink, so I'm very happy I found pink. I pick it up, I bring it home, and I'm like, I got the wrong size. I got size 4, not size 5. Okay, so this happens to me a lot. Uh, maybe you guys are better. Okay, so, so that's a natural human error, right? So you, you pick something that's nearby, it looks similar, but you know, one little aspect of it is different, but it looks visually the same. So how many of you have ordered stuff from Amazon.com? Really? Only so many? Not everybody? <laughs> Who hasn't? <laughs> okay, pretty much everyone has. Okay, how many of you have been shipped the wrong order? Okay, different from what you entered. What, what, really? That's okay. That's, I've given this talk a number of places with pretty large audiences. That may be the first time. Well, okay, so, so the, the fact is the error rate is extremely low. Okay? So you're almost never shipped an item that's the wrong size, or the wrong color, or something like that. How do they do that? Are they superhuman? Are they amazing? They, they may be, but um, they actually are pretty ingenious. So the way that um, the warehouses are arranged in Amazon is that if you need a Tinker Barrel underwear that's pink and of size 5, it is not placed next to pink Tinker Barrel underwear of size 4. Instead, it's placed next to a red race car. And the red race car is ne placed next to yellow big pens which are placed next to, um, you know, maybe folder dividers, which are then placed next to Tinker Bear underwear that's pink and of size 4. So things are very well separated, so that things that are visually similar are not placed next to each other in bins. And so therefore, the person who is doing the order fulfillment looks at what's there, is directed to the right aisle and the section, and when they go to that area, there's only one item that's even visually remotely similar to what they need to pick up, and they go pick it up and they get it, okay? So this arrangement is called an interleaving arrangement of, of these items in the center, okay? So um, this story, I hope, will become relevant in just a, a couple of minutes um, as I describe this grid cell code a little bit further. Okay, so one of the properties of the grid cell code is that it, it allows a unique representation of space over a very, very large range of locations. Um, so let me um, change pens here. So now suppose that the variable x, the location of the animal, just for now, for simplicity, suppose it's just um, um, natural numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, et cetera. And now suppose I'm considering two periods, 3 and 4, and I'm, okay, so I start increasing x from 0, and I go up, and so this phase is going 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, et cetera. This one is going 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, as a function of, of x. And what you see is, you know, these two phases together it's 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 0, 3. The pattern of the pairs does not repeat until what point? Until 12, okay? At 12, it's back to 0, 0. Okay, so now the, the, the unique coding, okay, is it's unique up to the product of 3 times 4. Okay, in general, it's, it's, it's a unique code up to the product of all the different n periods, okay? So the scaling, in fact, for real numbers, one can compute how this should scale for real numbers, but the range of x's locations for which there's a unique representation with this grid cell code scales exponentially with n, the number of different distinct periods that there are. Okay, so it's an exponential capacity or scaling um, in n. So it's not just exponential capacity, but there's also something very interesting about the structure of the grid cell code. Okay, and um, this is what the activity space looks like of those neurons, the grid cell neurons. Okay, this is a torus, okay, and it's actually n-dimensional. Um, and what uh, the code looks like is, suppose you start, this is x, okay, x goes from 0 to big R, which is this unique range that's exponential, and I've just rainbow colored it just for color coding, and we're going to check how as x increases this activity space, right, what is this point in activity space, neural activity space, how is it moving? Well, the points in neural activity space are moving along the surface of this torus. Let's zoom in a little bit and look. Okay, so we zoom in and look, 
this line, as you go from x equals 0, it starts out here, and it starts wrapping around this torus. And it completes one wrapping. Once it completes one wrapping here, it goes off the end, completes a wrapping. It comes back around a different point, and then continues wrapping, and continues wrapping, and so on. It keeps wrapping and wrapping. And you can see that one thing is very interesting is this interleaved structure. So the blue lines are not all close to other blue lines. In fact, the blue line is close to the red, which is close to the green, which is close to the light, light blue, and so on. So there's this interleaving structure in how activity space is distributed and representing um, x. And in fact, for good choice of all these periods, you know, this line, if I just kept going up to big R, would cover all the space. There would be no gray space. Okay? But um, if, I, if I say that the only coding that the animal distance that the animal cares to code is some smaller distance RL, these lines end up being very well separated from each other, separated by this gray space, which is not used for anything. So, yeah, so now if there's some noise, Okay, and um, now suppose that this is, this is the activity space, right? Neural activity space, and the noise is the neural activity space. Neurons are spiking, Poisson spikes, and so on. Now imagine that there's um, a, a noise, which I represented by this ball, this gray ball, right? The noise can put you somewhere in this gray ball. Well, as long as this gray ball is radius, is half the distance or less to the next coding line, then you're always going to get corrected back to the correct coding line. Okay, and in fact, even if the gray ball is bigger, but you already know that you cannot spontaneously jump from this location far on this end to this location far at the other end, because by the way, RL is still a very exponentially large distance. In fact, for very reasonable values of the period's lambda, just 10 different values from 30 centimeters up to 3 meters, the Rs that you get are uh, um, astronomically large. They're as big as the distance from here to the moon. Okay, so surely the animal does not care about coding all those distances. So as long as you care about coding distances only from zero to RL, some smaller distance, um, these lines are well separated, and all errors that are made in this ball can be corrected to the nearest coding line, which then put you in the vicinity of the true location. Okay, and in fact, because this coding line is stretched out so much, exponentially much, then local errors in any small segment of this coding line are so stretched out, they represent a very small distance and true location. And in fact, these errors that are residual between this, this dot here, the true location, and any point in this line are exponentially small in the number n. Okay, so the bottom line is that any noise smaller than this, this um, sphere can be um, corrected. The size of the sphere and the distance between these lines depends on how many periods n there are. The coding line is a stretch version of the position interval um, in this n-dimensional space of activity. And the effects of error can be reduced exponentially in n because of the stretching of, the, of, the, of this encoded variable in the activity space. By contrast, classical population codes are not stretched. You just take this line that needs to be encoded, and you just embed it in this n-dimensional activity space unstretched. So an error, a ball of error of the same size as a ball of error here, which is like this ball between these lines, um, this ball here corresponds to a much bigger fraction of the total line, okay? And that's why it's polynomial. Okay, so here is just the, the results that show you that the, the green curve is the, is, the, is the distribution of decoded locations for a specific location of the animal, uh, noisy samples of it, and the black curve is the posterior probability. It's the distribution of possible decoded locations using the grid cell code, comparable number of neurons, same amount of noise per neuron, et cetera. So this black peak is exponentially narrower than this green peak as a function of the number of, um, of different codes. OK, so I'm going to skip this, but the numerical, um, numerics validate this theory that there should be exponential scaling of, of the error. And in fact, the, the, the information rate stays perfectly finite in all of this case. Okay? So um, for details, you can um, talk to me or look at various papers. All right, so the bottom line is that this grid cell code makes it possible to have exponentially vanishing error at an asymptotically finite information rate. And in the Shannon sense, the grid cell code is a strong neural code. OK, so I'm going to spend the last minute um, or so just telling you um, the following statement. Okay, I won't have time to describe it. But so far, everything that I've described to you, it's not a theory or a model. It's just a series of deductive statements saying that given the properties of the grid code that are observed by experimentalists, what properties does it have? What is it capable of? Okay, and the question is, though, I haven't tried to address yet, is does the brain actually exploit any of these latent capabilities of this grid cell code, which is a new class of codes? And so the only answer I can provide, I don't know the answer to that. Experiments will tell us the answer to that. But the one statement I can make is that a rather hippocampal-like circuit 
can implement good decoding of the grid code. So the entorhinal cortex where the grid cells reside um, is the input, the primary cortical input to the, to the hippocampus. And the circuit of uh, the CA3 area and the CA1 field of the hippocampus together form in, in a very straightforward way um, the appropriate decoder for this grid cell code to be able to exploit these error correction capabilities. Okay, so the details are here, um, which, which I won't provide, but I can, um, we'll be very happy to discuss. So, so the bottom line is that um, in this kind of path integration task where each location is represented by a grid code location versus a classical population code, like a place cell code, okay, let's compute how the errors grow with time. So here's a path integration task where, you know, you start from a known location, go out, represent each location by neurons, which are noisy, decode, and then update, and then represent, et cetera, and keep going. And here's the squared errors, the distance between the, the final red and blue arrows. So we're plotting squared error versus, you, you can think of it as time or the mean distance traveled. Here is the result of the grid code, okay? The final error is about 30 centimeters. Here in green is the result of classical population codes. Um, there's actually a, a, a 10 to the four-fold improvement in the accuracy of the grid cell um, system with this um, place cell-like decoder than if you just had place cells alone coding for location. So just to conclude with the discussion section, why, given the superior performance of these exponentially strong um, codes, why are there any classical population codes in the brain, right? Why? Why not have only these strong codes? I don't know, but my guess is that maybe it's because of lower decoding complexity, okay? Are there other exponentially strong population codes in the brain? Again, I don't know but I'd wager money on it, okay? And that's the agenda of my group to, um, in the short term to try and find examples of um, such behavior. Um, where should we look for them, okay? Um, well, the places where you would look for strong error correcting codes is places that are doing computations where precision is critical, okay? And where a lower decoding speed and higher complexity of decoding are tolerable. So the, the one cost of these strong error correcting codes is that they're complex to decode. Okay, so, so those things um, are, are, are the key. So just to summarize, um, classical population codes in the Shannon sense are weak codes um, in, in terms of noise error correction. Um, the grid cell representation allows exponential reduction of noise uh, induced errors with neuron number. Okay, and the grid code advantage, you may think of it, one way to think about it is to think that the advantage is due to the specific response heterogeneity in different cell groups encoding the same quantity. So the different networks with different spatial periods of the response you can think of them as having heterogeneous response to the same quantity, location, okay? And finally, more than six decades have elapsed since Shannon's stunning result, right? And I think it's time that we extend these ideas to the neural context, right? So the hunt for exponentially strong codes is on.